Leading the next technical session is Dr. Jeff Allstott, Director for Technology and National Security for the National Security Council. Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Accelerating Innovation in AI Hardware to Make Decisions at the Edge Faster session. Uh, I'm Jeff Allstott. I work at the White House at the National Security Council, where I'm Director for Technology and National Security. But in a previous life, I was at IARPA, which is like DARPA for the intelligence community. And so I'm very excited to be here to support my DARPA cousins in their Electronic Resurgence Initiative Summit. So what is this session about? AI, as done through machine learning these days, is historically done by big computation, taking lots of energy and increasingly done in large specialized rigs or data centers. AI at the Edge, which this session is about, is about the process of bringing AI away from those large data centers, away from the large and power hungry computers and into mobile or low power devices. We all have personal experience with this in our smartphones, which increasingly have specialized chips in them designed to run low power deep neural networks for voice recognition, object identification, et cetera. AI at the edge is all run, unlock, already unlocking great capabilities like what I just described, but it's going to unlock even more that we haven't even imagined yet for both private sector use and for national security. So how do we do this? There are two central processes so far. One is to make the models smaller. You can take some big deep neural network with a bazillion parameters and you can try to shrink the number of parameters, reduce the number of layers. You can even just go from floating point 64 to 32 or even down to just 8 bit. Another route is to make the chips more specialized, such as optimizing the circuitry for multiply accumulate operations and so on. We'll be hearing today from speakers on these and perhaps other techniques which are being used to increase the performance of AI at the edge. As you are learning from these technical experts, I encourage you though to think about another thing as well. As we are building out all these cool capabilities on chips and then putting those chips out on the edge, we're also sending those chips into harm's way and those chips might come to harm, particularly in national security contexts. By pushing operations to the edge, be it in the national security mission or even in some commercial operations, we are giving adversaries more opportunities to mess with and steal our stuff than if those same capabilities had been sitting in a building that we control back at home. And maybe we should plan ahead for that. In the 20th century, we made fundamental design decisions for how chips would be built with little consideration for security and now we are paying for it in the 21st century. As an example, a heck of a lot of cyber attacks use the fact that a chip's memory can hold both data and instructions, meaning a user with permission to send in data can send in instructions, which the CPU then interprets as instructions. I've heard the majority of techs use this trick, which is only possible because of a chip design decision made in the distant history of computers. In recent years, DARPA performers have created alternative chip designs that wouldn't have this security weakness, but it's a few decades too late. Everything's already baked in and we're headed a particular direction with the way that our chips are, are built. Let us not repeat the same mistakes of baking in insecure designs into this next generation of AI chips for the edge. I am imploring Sharpa's tech wizards to try to identify and implement possible security problems and security solutions now as they are building out the next generation of AI chips so we can head off a slew of problems. There are specific problems that we already know can happen. So firstly, the AI model itself can be stolen. If a company or a government spent a lot of time and resources into making some fancy AI, which is on that chip, we might not want that AI to walk off that chip into an adversary's hands. Similarly, the AI model can be modified. If that AI is being used for some critical purpose, be that in critical infrastructure or in a national security context, an adversary might have incentive to get in there and subtly modify the AI, putting in a back door so that the AI misbehaves in certain contexts. It'd be very difficult to identify that that's happened. Lastly, chips can be stolen. If the chip itself is a thing that we've spent a lot of effort into making super cool and fancy, we wouldn't want that chip to fall into the wrong hands. But if we're sending the chip uh, off into uh, contested environments, the chip could fall into the wrong hands. So that might be a thing that we would regret. I'm sure that there are other problems, but these are just a few that I've thought of. The people who are watching this session today, I imagine if they give it a few moments of thought to put on their black hat, 
would be able to identify other problems and other opportunities for an adversary to wreck your day. So thankfully, there are possible solutions to these issues in terms of things we can build into the chip design. We can make chips such that you can't steal the model. There's no way to get read access to those AI parameters. We could make chips where you can't modify the model. There's no way to get write access to those AI parameters. You can make chips that you can't do certain things with them, be it reading or writing or just executing, without having certain permissions, perhaps verified through cryptographic keys. And since we're talking about the future here, I would really love it if those keys were quantum resistant. It would be great if we had chips that would just fry themselves if a user tried to violate any of these issues. And hopefully that would be a thing that could be done even within a low power environment. You can conceive of making chips that are trackable, that just have a little component in there that if connected to the internet, phones to home base and says what's up. But there are other ways that possibly the chips could be tracked without connecting to the internet. Are there other solutions? I'm, I'm sure that there are. And the people who are watching this session, I suspect, are far more qualified than I am to try to come up with those. So thank you for attending today. In the upcoming talks, thank you for listening and considering how to build the future of AI at the edge, which will produce powerful capabilities for everyone. But also, thank you for not only thinking about how to build AI at the edge that is performant, but is also secure. We are building the future here. Let's build it well. Now discussing next generation computing architectures and runtime reconfigurability for mixed workloads, DARPA MTO Program Manager, Dr. Ali Keshavarzi, and Vice President of Architecture Research at NVIDIA, Dr. Steve Keckler. My name is Ali Keshavarzi, and I'm a Program Manager at MTO in DARPA. We have prepared an exciting technical session where several research thought leaders discuss various aspects of improving computing efficiency and performance. Today's session focuses on increasing the information processing efficiency for making faster decisions at the edge and in the field. This session connects several DARPA MTO ERI research efforts. I will talk about increasing computing efficiency. Dr. Steve Keckler, the Vice President of Research at NVIDIA, will discuss their research on Symfony architecture in STH program for next generation computing that allows runtime reconfigurability for mixed workloads and a variety of data sets. Michael, uh, Professor Michael Taylor from University of Washington describes their STH approach called Hammer Blade. We also have talks on computing foundational building blocks in Frank program by Jeff Antis from Applied Materials and uh, Professor Saif Salahuddin from UC Berkeley. Another talk covers the micro exploration research topic from PAPA program on compiler programming by Professor Vivek Sarkar from Georgia Tech. These research efforts enable dual use applications. Here we are describing MTO's efforts on new computing architectures and new materials. Applications demand increasing computing efficiency while delivering the performance for the system requirements. We want to break from one top per watt barrier. This chart plots on x-axis power from high to low going right versus performance on the y-axis. Contours of constant compute efficiency are shown in dashed lines. Today's computing architectures are stuck at around one top per watt. Breaking this efficiency barrier is the problem that is motivating us. And consequently, approaches to solve this problem set the future research efforts. The goal is to march toward 1,000 tops per watt efficiency to enable applications that need high performance and high throughput with low power, as shown by the green arrow on the chart. With ongoing research in programs like SDH, one tops per watt is being pushed toward 10 tops per watt. Solving the problem requires research in multiple fronts in technology, circuits, and architectures, not mentioning the orthogonal demand for algorithmic improvements along the way. We have talked about 1000x, improving algorithms included. SCH is improving efficiency by 10x in the future, pushing for another 100x and greater. We are in the middle of a perfect storm that explains the challenges we are facing. The audience is familiar with uh, dimensional and then are the scaling limitations. 
energy scaling issues across memory, compute, communication, efficiencies in architecture, domains and specialization, while maintaining programmability, technology for new devices. Let me emphasize the chart on the right that shows the energy cost of data movement. The yellow dot is going to the cloud, and the purple is local compute. This chart illustrates a case for increasing the locality of computing density. This perfect storm explains what is preventing us to achieve the required performance at much lower power consumption, and at the same time, the opportunities for research in finding solutions. Research in architectures, processing structures, devices, memories, and materials. An example of research is my ERI program on software-defined hardware, or SDH, research on next generation of computing, not general purpose, but for data-oriented workloads and algorithms, as is shown in the charts on dense, sparse, and graph algorithms workloads across the board for signal processing, machine learning, optimization classes of problems. Let's explain what STH research is about more next. STH accelerates computing efficiencies and at the same time uh, wants to maintain flexibility. Uh, it orchestrates the data movement and access to achieve ASIC-like performance with programmability that we all are asking for. Uh, this chart on the right side shows the software stack uh, for uh, STH that is an important uh, uh, part of this program. At the, on the left, the hardware that shows the flexibility that we have to process, uh, to do computing and do data movement along for a variety of memory usage in STH. STH pushes the boundaries in von Neumann architectures by bringing memory closer or near the compute. Frank is looking at foundational building blocks and new materials that may be extended to processing in memory to lower the memory access time and reduce energy costs of memory access. That way, gaining efficiency by this approach. And also use ideas such as embedded non-volatile memory for regular von Neumann architectures that we are using today but denser and with fast access time. Going forward, we are interested in research on technologies and architectures to merge logic and memory in continuation of improving compute efficiency. That is shown on the y-axis in this chart. And performance on the x-axis. And that is represented by the arrow that is commensurate with the goals we discussed at the beginning of this talk and the research to solve the problems along the way. I would like to thank you for your attention. Enjoy today's session and the entire URLI Summit. Thank you again. My name is Steve Keckler, and I'm the Vice President of Architecture Research at NVIDIA. Today, I will tell you about some of our research in the software-defined hardware program that increases performance and efficiency of computer systems for next-generation data-intensive and mixed workloads. Some emerging application domains of interest to NVIDIA and the DoD include autonomous vehicles, intelligent video analytics, and wireless communications processing. Each of these domains requires the processing of massive amounts of data in a time-critical fashion, and thus are both compute and data intensive. These applications are served by workloads that span machine learning and image and signal processing, which in turn rely upon tensor and graph analytics algorithms. Some of these applications uh, require data that is inherently in, uh, dense and can employ dense tensor algebra algorithms. For others, the data is sparse and requires irregular data access and processing to be efficient. Classical von Neumann architectures have been used to implement these algorithms on contemporary computer systems, including both CPUs and GPUs. These architectures share a number of common characteristics. They are controlled completely in software and employ a program counter and a stored program. Software loops and procedures traverse the data and use loads and stores to access memory. These memory accesses are tightly coupled with computation operations, meaning that, meaning that memory address calculation and data processing are co-located and synchronized. Finally, processing, processing and main memory are logically and physically separated in the system. 
However, these architectures are inefficient in a number of ways. The process of fetching, decoding, and executing each instruction carries energy costs that become significant. Long memory operations require large on-chip RAMs to serve as reserve landing pads for outstanding memory references. While vector units can exploit data parallelism and reduce instruction overheads, they are rigid and often cannot be used for common computation patterns. The nature of the cache hierarchy moves unnecessary data, specifically when only a fraction of a cache line is useful. Finally, all data is moved throughout the entire memory hierarchy, even if it is used just once, unnecessarily expending data movement energy. In contrast, our research has explored a new class of architectures that employ explicit distributed data orchestration, or EDDO. Broadly speaking, EDDO architectures provide more direct control of data movement to the programming system. Our architecture, called Symphony, is organized into compute tiles and data orchestration tiles. At the top of the diagram on the left, you see compute tiles that include dense configurable parallel math units called FlexMath that can adapt to different computation patterns. In the middle are configurable data orchestration units that can be used for metadata processing, just-in-time data delivery, and local synchronization. These programmable and configurable compute units are distributed throughout the memory hierarchy so they can process data precisely where the data needs to be processed. Point-to-point -point channels can be used to uh, facilitate efficient data pipelining. Finally, data is pushed explicitly from, from the DRAM to compute rather than requiring the full round trip that you normally see in a load store architecture. To draw an analogy, data orchestration architectures are like a symphony orchestra. They employ instruments which are a form of specialization either in the compute or the memory hierarchy. There's a score which is the set of distributed programs and configurations that the instruments play. There are multiple instruments in a section, which, are, which is effectively parallelism uh, in different parts of the system. Musicians can even play multiple instruments, which is a form of multiplexing over a single piece of hardware. And finally, there's a conductor that facilitates synchronization and cooperation throughout the system. In our Symphony architecture, we have developed a range of instruments used to make processing of dense and sparse data more efficient. I've already mentioned the FlexMath Flexible Tensor Compute Accelerator. FlexMath can be configured to execute different sizes and shapes of matrix multiply kernels, as well as different types of convolutions, the building blocks of many tensor algebra algorithms. To aid with sparse tensor processing, we developed Extensor, which accelerates the intersection of sparse data structures to identify overlap of common non-zero elements. We develop SPZIP to accelerate compression and decompression of streaming data as it traverses the memory hierarchy, thus reducing the number of bits that must be moved. Buffets are an intelligent and configurable buffer with support for data synchronization and streaming. Pattern generators offload address generation from a programmable processor and can be deployed near main memory to reduce memory access overheads. Finally, we develop Phi, which accelerates data reductions, a common operation in sparse linear algebra and graph algorithms. Now, let me show you an example of how a simple algorithm is expressed in an EDDO architecture. Take a sparse element-wise vector multiply, in which the only necessary multiplication operations are those in which both, ve in which both vectors have non-zero elements. Each of the vectors is stored in a sparse fashion with a with a packed vector of coordinates and a packed vector of data elements. The algorithm first fetches the coordinates of each vector using a sequential memory read operation. These coordinate vectors are, there inter are then intersected to find the indices of common non-zero elements. Gather memory readers then fetch the corresponding non-zero data elements from each vector, which are then multiplied together in the compute units. Finally, the values are scattered back into memory using the non-zero coordinate vector from the intersection. This algorithm can be mapped onto the Symphony hardware by employing both programmable and configurable elements. Starting at the bottom left, we see the sequential memory readers, which can be deployed on uh, the data orchestration tiles in your DRAM, fetching the metadata uh, and delivering the coordinates into storage at the next level of the memory hierarchy. An intersection operation is performed uh, at that level of the memory hierarchy 
uh, which then allows the gather memory readers to fetch the non-zero data and deliver it to those payloads all the way up to the compute tiles. Once the computation is complete, the data is then sent back down the memory hierarchy to the scatter memory writer at that same level of the memory hierarchy where the intersection was performed, and the data is then delivered back to the DRAM. To understand the efficiency opportunities of EDDO architectures, we compared our Symphony architecture through detailed simulation to a contemporary production Volta GPU. On the left, the Symphony Vivaldi system, as we call it, includes four Symphony processing clusters, each with a memory and compute hierarchy similar to the Symphony diagrams I showed earlier. We model Symphony using the same process technology as this GPU and approximately the same memory bandwidth. Because Symphony does not require large, large register files to buffer in-flight memory references, its on-chip RAM requirements are notably smaller, which leaves room for additional compute units to be placed throughout the memory hierarchy. The result is a total amount of area that's even less than, than the Volta processor. The graph at the left shows the energy efficiency of these two systems, measured in billions of floating point 32 operations per second per watt, also known as GOPS per watt across a range of applications. Our results show that on dense tensor algebra workloads, Symphony is about 10 times more efficient than a GPU when implemented in the same process technology. These efficiencies are due to a number of factors, including uh, employment of the flex math configurable pipelines, offloading of the, of the address and pattern generation from uh, the uh, programmable compute units, uh, producer comp uh, consumer data pipelines, which reduces data uh, access through memory, and processing near memory, which reduces the distance that the data must travel. On the sparse tensor and graph workloads, Symphony is about 100 times more energy efficient than the GPU, largely due to specialized storage idioms uh, implemented via buffets that allow the sparse data to be uh, marshaled and, and organized and orchestrated throughout the memory hierarchy efficiently. This process allows us to bypass unnecessary buffers, thereby aligning unnecessary energy consumption for data movement. And again, we also employ processing near memory uh, for data efficiency. Finally, uh, for one of the applications in particular, a configurable caching uh, unit is effective in reducing the memory bandwidth required for indirect memory accesses. This table shows the extended list of Symphony instruments and how they are used by different applications. The green boxes represent the most important instruments to dense tensor workloads, while the blue boxes indicate the most important instruments for sparse workloads. As you can see from the table, there is no single magic bullet. The instruments combine to form the Symphony Orchestra that works together to provide the overall efficiency gains. Looking forward, we have considered how to translate what we have learned into future products. As you may already realize, today's GPUs are no longer fixed function accelerators for a single application domain. Instead, they are general purpose programmable parallel processors with hardware support to accelerate application domains such as raster graphics, ray tracing, and small matrix multiplications common in machine learning and scientific workloads. We expect that the key concepts of our Symphony architecture can be applied to programmable GPUs by incorporating key capabilities into existing GPU structures. For example, the FlexMath configurable math pipelines can be incorporated into uh, the streaming multiprocessors of a contemporary GPU, uh, much in the same way as, as tensor cores are today. Processing throughout the memory hierarchy can be deployed by adding compute units to our L2 cache hierarchies or memory controllers. These same memory structures can behave as smart buffers merely by adding some additional capability uh, to track synchronization um, and uh, behaviors like uh, FIFOs inside the, uh, inside the memory units. Finally, uh, the same places can, can deploy uh, accelerators for sparse metadata processing. We believe the best way forward is to, is to combine the best of programmable and fixed function capabilities to achieve ASIC-like efficiencies in a general purpose computing environment. Finally, we have not closed the book on further methods for efficient hardware and software on dense and sparse workloads. On the software side, we've only scratched the surface of high-level programming abstractions that can efficiently express sparse computations in a manner amenable to hardware interpretation. In addition, while we have de developed some tools for mapping, 
binding and optimization of algorithms onto a complex hierarchy of distributed processing and memory components, there is ample opportunity to automate the process. On the hardware side, we expect opportunities to develop new hardware efficient sparse data represent representations that facilitate both locality and load balancing. Finally, we anticipate opportunities for new instruments such as dynamic streaming operations to further facilitate the generation of efficient data pipelines. Thank you very much for your time. And now, presenting Dr. Michael Taylor, Associate Professor at the University of Washington. Hi, my name is Michael Taylor, and I'm a professor at the University of Washington. And today, I'm going to be talking about Hammerblade, which is a project funded by the DARPA Software Defined Hardware Program. The motivation for Hammerblade is as follows. If we think about the evolution of hardware over time, we started out with CPUs. And then in 1993, Doom was released, and we had 3D graphics as a major application driving uh, PC sales. And as a result, uh, 3D graphics were becoming mainstream, and accelerators for 3D graphics were developed in the form of GPUs, graphic processing units. And it became effectively part of the PC platform. We fast forward to slightly before 2012, deep learning uh, was not a favored form of machine learning, except in a small number of domains. But in 2012, the connection between deep learning, graphics processors, and large data sets harvested over the internet finally came together and set off the deep learning revolution. Shortly after, Google released the specialized tensor processing unit for deep learning. And then shortly after that, a version two and a version three and a version four. And so we see a case where we have increasing specialization of hardware, but it's re resulting in rapid obsolescence. Sarah Hooker, who is a researcher at, Google, at the Google Brain team, has a fascinating paper about what she calls the hardware lottery. In the hardware lottery, the idea is that the previous generations of hardware are shaping the path of research and effectively what ideas we're able to develop. And so we're introducing effectively a historical bias into what we're able to compute and what new innovations we're able to come up with. So if we think about this compute stack that we had over uh, time, CPUs are biased towards legacy code. GPUs were biased towards 3D graphics code. And the TPUs are biased to the previous generations of neural networks. So it's an interesting question that we're asking with Hammerblade, which is, can we develop a general purpose parallel fabric that doesn't have these built-in biases to previous applications and can provide a new fabric for new application domains as they're released? And so we see here, Hammerblade being used when new domains come out. And if the domain becomes big enough to justify specialized silicon, then we can consider having specialized variants of Hammerblade. So let me give you a brief overhead overview of the Hammerblade hardware. So Hammerblade is a rack scale accelerator. It contains many 2U chassis that are connected by hundreds of 100 gigabit cables. And each chassis contains a motherboard with uh, an ASIC and uh, high-end Xilinx FPGA with high bandwidth memory. Each ASIC contains a large number of Hammerblade pods, and each pod contains over 100 uh, tile, compute tiles, and uh, a memory system that goes to HBM. And we leverage the RISC-V IAT instruction set architecture. So these tiles can be either many core tiles, uh, having a high performance general purpose compute unit, with floating point, they can be dense accelerator tiles, sparse accelerator tiles, or graph accelerator tiles. And we're able to use the RISC-V ISA to tie all of this together. In terms of software, we're currently focusing on today's popular domain-specific languages, PyTorch, TVM, and Graphit. Graphit is for graphs. TVM can be used for sparse ML, graph embedding, and dense machine learning. And PyTorch is used for dense machine learning and sparse ML. And these DSLs are mapped down onto a C++ and Hammerblade intermediate representation that then is mapped down onto the variety of tiles. We recently did a programmability evaluation for DARPA using some DARPA-selected workloads, and we were able to show that a very small number of lines of code have to be changed in order to port these DSL implementations to Hammerblade. And we have also very good results for energy. We have a Hammerblade V0 ASIC that we taped out in 2019. It contains a single pod with 135 many-core tiles. 
it hits over two gigahertz at maximum frequency. And it, uh, this prototype was running up high torch in graphic workloads. Upcoming in January, we're going to have a, a monster hammer blade prime piece of silicon, uh, which has a, a much greater number of resources. It will be very interesting. You can see some of the hammer blade tie-ins. We have the Black Parrot project, which is a 64-bit RISC-V Linux-capable multi-core in System Verilog. It's funded by DARPA Posh. It's available on GitHub. BaseJump SDL, which is a universal component library for System Verilog and is used to implement Hammerblade and Black Parrot. And then TensorSource, which is a tensor core generator funded by DARPA RTML that we'll be releasing uh, relatively soon. So in conclusion, we have a bunch of publications that you can check out to see this exciting project. And in terms of what comes next, we are envisioning that we will see much more of the silicon eating the software, new application domains turning into specialized implementations. We are particularly excited about enabling the metaverse with Hammerblade and Pangenomics. And we're also excited about extending the scope of rack scale accelerators, where we take many, many accelerator chips and build them into tightly coupled systems to attack these new exciting application domains. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Welcoming back to the stage, Dr. Ali Keshavarzi alongside Dr. Jeff Anthes, Technical Staff at Applied Materials, and Dr. Saif Salahuddin, Professor at the University of California at Berkeley. My name is Ali Keshavarzi. I'm back briefly to discuss the Frank program. Uh, to continue with our session on increasing uh, information processing efficiency, we highlight uh, research efforts in the FRANC program that is about new material and foundations, enabling new embedded non-volatile memory and new computing materials. Basically, the idea is to improve memory access time for various memories and within a range of memory densities. We have two speakers today, Dr. Jeff Antis from Applied Materials, uh, describing new resistive uh, random access memories, RAM material, and processes that make analog memory. Uh, Professor Saif Salahuddin from UC Berkeley discusses the prospects for uh, ferroelectric embedded non-volatile memory. Enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you. Hello. I'd like to start by thanking the ERI organizers for inviting me to speak today. I'd also like to thank our Frank program managers, uh, Ali Keshavarazi, and a special thanks to YK Chen for all of his support and direction over the past few years in this program. Uh, importantly, I also want to thank my co-authors who are listed here. They've done the vast majority of the work that will be presented today and without whom this presentation would not be possible. So today I'm going to talk about volume vacancy RAM or VVRAM for short. This is a materials development project under the Frank program. Uh, in the early phases, we started with really exploratory research type development. And now as we've moved into later phases, we're looking at more device development and memory development. And I'll be sharing the device and memory development with you today. So the overall goal of this program was to develop a new high density memory material that can seamlessly be integrated into CMOS. We believe that volume vacancy RAM is a great candidate for this application. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what volume vacancy RAM is. So in the name, we have volume, which refers to the switching, which occurs through the volume of the entire cell and vacancy, meaning that we have a vacancy mediated switching mechanism. And with, with this vacancy mediated switching mechanism, we don't need a forming voltage. And in, in fact, in many cases, our first sweep is a reset sweep. The important feature of volume vacancy RAM though is the fact that we get total volume switching. If we look on the top left or top right diagram, we see that state of the art filamentary based memory switching. And in the model on the right side of the diagram, we see that the filament formation in, it can, uh, does not take up the entire volume of the cell. And therefore the formation and dissolution and reformation can be slightly different every time the material switches. This leads to a current voltage curve that we see on the left side of the diagram. And it shows that when you sweep your voltage, you can have abrupt 
changes in current with the sweep, which leads to low reliability. Now, if we look at volume vacancy RAM on the bottom figure, on the right side of that figure is our model, which shows that our switching occurs throughout the entire volume of the cell. And this is very important because when you switch throughout the entire volume of the cell, it is the same every time. And this leads to reliability and consistency, which can be seen on the butterfly plot, current voltage plot on the left side of the graph, where we see very smooth transitions with our set and reset. All of this leads to uh, uh, reliability at low switching currents. We see switching currents in the range of nanoamps. Um, and 128 discrete levels of switching is available through this, and I'll get to that later in the talk. So before we get into some of our device data and, and electrical data for memory materials, I do want to spend a little bit of time on the material optimizations that we've done. As I mentioned in the beginning, we've done a lot of uh, material screening and new material development in this program, but we've talked about that in the past, and I won't cover it here. Uh, I do want to point out, though, that all of this work has been done on coupons, which has allowed us to do high throughput screening of many different material stacks and different processes. And th some of those are exemplified here. If we look in the top left, you see a general layout of the VVRAM stack. Uh, we use typically a two material system, uh, material layer one, which is in green, and a material layer two in blue. Um, in some cases, we've looked at a tri-layer stack where we've included a material layer zero, which is below material layer one, to make a sandwich stack. Beyond the typical physical metrology that we use for these materials, such as TEM, XRD, and XPS, we've also developed a screening process for electrical behavior. And this is, this is very important for our fast screening um, and understanding what's going to happen electrically. Uh, if you look at the two butterfly charts on this page, they are examples of what we look for, where we, where we sweep the voltage um, in two different directions and try to maximize hysteresis between the two forward and reverse voltages. And that's exemplified by the green arrow on both of, both of these plots. So taking that into account, we've looked at, I have two examples of material optimization on this slide. One is a material optimization, optimization looking at different materials, and the other is a process optimization looking at the same material with different process conditions. On the left, it's a material optimization where we looked at a low K material in, in green, a higher K in red, and a tri-layer stack in orange. And you can see that the lower K material gave the best hysteresis, where the higher K material actually gave almost no hysteresis at all. And the tri-layer stack was somewhere in the middle. We believe that the tri-layer stack is something that may be worth pursuing in the future, but we have moved forward with the lower K material because it gave the best results in this experiment. Moving on to uh, process optimization, in, in this case we were looking at material layer one and we had modeling results that indicated that the morphology of material layer one was very important for maximizing hysteresis, and we believe we can control that morphology by changing the deposition temperatures. So we looked at a high deposition temperature, a medium, and a low temperature. And you can see that the mid temperature in the green plot on the right shows the best hysteresis. And in fact, the high temperature and the low temperature depositions gave very, very poor hysteresis. Now this result wasn't exactly a surprise to us because as I mentioned, we do physical metrology on these materials as well as we're developing them. And we knew from the XRD data that the mid-temperature deposition did give us the metrology or the morphology that we were looking for in this case. So now we'll jump into some of the interesting device and memory results. And as I mentioned earlier, a key important factor of volume vacancy RAM is the total volume switching, and that is indicated by current scaling with the area of the device. If we look at the butterfly graph on the left, we have our current voltage sweeps, but in this case, we're not changing any of the material, and we're looking at different device sizes. When you go from the blue to the to the green to the red curves, we're increasing in device size, and you can see that with this device size increase, our current scales nicely. Another thing to point out on this is that each of the devices show very good hysteresis with about 100x between the forward sweep and the reverse sweep. Now, 
seeing that the current scales with area is a very important indicator to say that we have total volume switching, but it's not the important part of this important feature of volume vacancy RAM. The important feature is that we get very smooth transitions. And these smooth transitions are very important because many analog states are predicated on reliable current steps with small voltage sweeps. And we show this over on the graph on the right, where we show 128 uh, level states that have been set with very small voltage sweep voltage sweeps. Um, and you can see our states are set between about 400 nanoamps up to about four microamps. If you look at the blowups in the red, you can see six of the higher higher current uh, devices and six of the lower current devices in the box in blue. I would also point out that each of these boxes represents 32 different devices. So this is a, a very nice example of being able to set multi-level states by using the very smooth curves that are generated with total volume switching in VVRAM. So on this last slide, I want to show some of our most recent data where we're looking at image recognition accuracy. And what we've done is developed a software simulator using the LE net and, and input our real world 128 seven bit data from the previous slide from VVRAM and extracted the accuracy based on the MNIST data set. And you can see that on the bar graph on the right that our, our VVRAM is at parity with, with the floating point data. And this is an exciting new result for us, but we know that the MNIST data set is only the beginning. As we move into the future, we want to scale to 300 millimeter and get this material fab ready. And we know this is going to be required when we start looking at data sets that are much higher weights. So with that, um, I thank you and hope to be able to show you even better data and more recognition in the future. I am Saif Salahuddin from the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at University of California, Berkeley. I will be talking about ferroelectric memory devices as a potential embedded memory solution. One of the major workloads for computing today is the artificial intelligence or the AI. The AI networks require a lot of memory to store their parameters. And right now, the amount of on-chip memory we have is not large enough to solve that need. In addition, the deep neural networks are increasing almost 1.5 times annually. The way we are solving that need today is by stacking high bandwidth DRAM chips with CPUs and GPUs using silicon interposer. Now DRAM in its own right is a fantastic memory technology, but in this solution, in this stacked solution, the power and performance is completely determined by the off-chip communication. In this context, within the FRAN program, we are looking into new solutions where a memory can be embedded and still offer high capacity, fast read speed, and low energy per bit that are critical for AI applications. There are a number of emerging memory devices that fits that bill, especially the resistive uh, switching memory devices. Uh, some examples are the magnetic random access memory, the resistive random access memory, the phase change memory, etc. One of the common features of all these resistive switching memory devices is the fact that they are added in series with the drain of the transistor. As a result, the read speed is determined by the resistance of the memory element itself. By contrast, in a ferroelectric FET, the memory element is located at the gate of the transistor. This means that the drain current is not impeded by the, resist by the resistance of the memory element. 
This indicates that ferroelectric FETs can offer a very high rate of speed. To understand how a ferroelectric FET works, here we look into a simple schematic where a ferroelectric material has been integrated in the gate of the transistor. These materials have permanent dipoles which exerts an electric field on the channel and thereby controls the amount of electrons available to flow in the channel. As we apply an external electric field or voltage to switch the direction of the dipoles, it also controls the amount of electrons that are available and thereby the current flow. And as a result, we get to different values of the current for two different directions of the dipole. This gives us our memory. Within the Frank program over the last two years, we have been looking into the fundamentals of the ferroelectric materials and their integration with high performance silicon channel. And we have been able to make substantial advances. For example, we have demonstrated larger than 10 to 10 endurance cycles. This essentially tells us how many times we can switch the memory device. We have also demonstrated less than three volt operation at 100 nanosecond switching speed. This is, uh, this makes the memory completely embeddable without the need of a uh, charge pump. Combined with the endurance, this is, uh, this becomes a very important advance for this memory device. I want to point out here that the 10 days to 10 endurance cycle is five orders of magnitude larger than the state of the art. In addition, the measured write energy in this memory device was demonstrated to be 0.9 femtojoule per bit. That is 100x smaller than any other embedded memory solution that we know of. Also, the footprint area of the memory cell was demonstrated to be the same as a single fin in a 14 nanometer fin fed device. In that way, the cell area is at least five inches smaller than the SRAM cell area at the same node, which is 14 nanometers. Now, going beyond uh, simple memory applications, it is also possible to connect the ferroelectric FETs in various ways to create what we call a content addressable memory cell or a CAM cell. In a conventional memory array, we provide an address and we get back the data stored in that address. By contrast, in a CAM array, we provide actually the data and then the array gives us back the answer whether or not that data is actually available in the array. As a result, CAM arrays are used for pattern matching, parallel search, lookup table, neuromorphic computing, and many other compute in memory applications. In the same way, ferroelectric FETs can be used to implement MAC kernel in binarized neural networks. So therefore, the FEFETs promise to substantially benefit the compute in memory applications. In summary, within the Frank program, we have demonstrated that ferroelectric FETs can be a very high density, high endurance, high rate speed, and very low energy memory solution and it can be completely embeddable. Therefore, ferroelectric FETs promise to impact AI applications substantially. Thank you. Next to the stage, welcome Chair of the School of Computer Science at Georgia Tech, Dr. Vivek Sarkar. Hi, I'm Vivek Sarkar from Georgia Tech, and I would like to talk to you today about compilers for portable productivity. So we believe that productivity is really important for the future of ERI hardware because it is the rate-limiting factor for hardware adoption. 
when you look at this inverted pyramid of developers involved in uh, producing uh, innovative application software, the majority are domain experts who want to be platform agnostic. They want to focus on innovating on their algorithms. They, in turn, depend on platform-aware developers who can develop libraries and frameworks and who, in turn, develop on platform experts at the very tip of the pyramid, the ninjas. Uh, our claim is that current programming systems are only accessible to these ninjas, and quite frankly, there aren't enough ninjas to go around for all the new hardware that you're developing in ERI 2.0. Today, I would like to talk to you about a DARPA micro exploration on performant automation of parallel program assembly, or PAPA. In this program, we demonstrated four orders of magnitude improvement in a unique figure of merit that combines productivity, portability, and performance, and showed how we could actually lower the barrier to deploying new algorithms, new science, on the specialized hardware that will come out of ERI innovations, and that will necessarily be low volume and not be able to sustain that investment in ninjas and uh, platform-aware developers. And as can be seen in the spider chart, this program scored really well on the key dimensions of generality, performance, productivity, and scalability, where we can have clusters of the kinds of chips that you all are developing. So at Georgia Tech, we developed a proof of concept in the PAPA program that targeted applications written in the Python language, which are really accessible to domain experts and used in multiple DoD application domains. The example here is from the radar domain, particularly the space-time adaptive processing application. And a key challenge in this application domain is the need to process large cubes of data with over a billion elements each with a real-time constraint of processing each cube in 30 milliseconds or 33 cubes a second. So for this application, our domain expert was able to experiment with their algorithm just using Python, NumPy, and basic sequential programming. Of course, that version of code far underperformed with respect to the desired target. You can see it's 0 0.0022 cubes per second, whereas we need 33 cubes per second. With extra effort, they could use a GPU that came a little closer, but still under one cube a second. What we were able to demonstrate is to take the code that was easiest for them to understand and develop, the original sequential Python NumPy, NumPy code, and automatically generate code that could run on a cluster of GPUs. And as you can see, with the results over here moving to the right, uh, with 24 nodes and six GPUs per node, we far exceeded the desired re real-time constraint of 33 cubes per second. So what difference will this make? We truly believe that productivity is the key to enabling the use of future semiconductor and microelectronics innovations underway in ERI 2.0. Uh, we know that many high-priority application domains will require simultaneous innovation in hardware and algorithms. It's not the case that the algorithm is fixed, and then you can just go work on developing hardware for that one algorithm. They need to be co-developed. So hardware agility has to be accompanied by software productivity, as illustrated in the graphic on the right. So with that, I would like to conclude with a variant of some uh, hallowed words for our nation. Bring us your wired, your core, your huddled hardware, yearning to breathe free, and we will make it productive. And for our final lightning talk of the day, DARPA Strategic Technology Office Program Manager, Dr. Tom Rondeau. Hi, I'm Tom Rondeau. I'm the program manager for the Domain Specific System on Chip program. Now this program is dealing with the sensor data collection problem that is a growing part of our future. Uh, with autonomous vehicles, automated factories, 5 and 6G, all of these are uh, areas to explore uh, for sensor processing. 
Now, as the amount of that sensor data that we desire to collect continues to increase, we need to match that problem with enhanced edge computing. And we know that a specialized chip like an ASIC uh, can perform a large amount of computation for very little power, but they are expensive to produce and they're only good for one thing at a time. Meanwhile, we have general purpose processors and computers that can do any computation, but not necessarily well. The domain-specific system on chip program aims to combine these concepts into a single many-core heterogeneous system on chip, or SOC. Now, this opportunity is depicted here uh, as a grid of processing elements, each with a different type of specialization for different processing needs out of a given application. In this case, this is IBM's uh, chip that they're building for their autonomous vehicle uh, problem set. Now, the challenge with such a chip is both how to specify what to accelerate, now that is, what type of processor element do we need, and then how to program such a complex chip. Our example that we're showing here is if we have a spe specific matrix multiplication core, we need to know when to use it and how to schedule its use to manage the overhead of data transfer. Now, right now, with these complex systems, they require specialized programming ninjas uh, to run them. So these ninjas uh, are, are highly advanced, highly skilled, very expensive, and hard to find. Uh, so how do we take care of uh, a problem like this? And the DSI program is taking on these challenges by making these kinds of complex chips both practical and usable. A key part of the DSOC challenge is what we call the ontology problem. We can create an ontology of how the DSOC operates based on the computational models and how they meet the application needs. Uh, this then informs what to accelerate, how to structure the, trip, the chip, uh, and how to automate the compilation and execution of the applications on that chip. So instead of relying on the hand optimization of these programming ninjas, we're building the intelligence into the chip to manage the data movement problem themselves. And as you can see here, data movement is one of our biggest challenges in the execution of, of algorithms on, on any given processor. The schedulers then manage the analysis uh, for where and when to move the data to maximize our par parallelization. We've already made strides in the runtime performance improvements computed automatically uh, compared to weeks or months of an expert so that hopefully we can re remove the need for these code ninjas. Uh, the program, uh, I should also mention, is working on existing chips as well, like the new multiprocessor chips, uh, such as new field programmable gate arrays, so that we can accelerate the programming and execution of new capabilities, even on the existing, currently available silicon. The program is currently yielding new designs, new software tools, and having multiple successes pushing technology in, in a number of domains forward. Uh, we have programmable chips from Arizona State University, uh, they're focused on signal processing so that we can advance uh, our ability to execute embedded software radio capabilities for wireless pro networking, radi radar processing, uh, phased array systems, et, et cetera. We also have Stanford, which is implementing SOC design tools that will easily work with visual processing systems and software. You can imagine these as enabling the next generation of augmented reality or extended reality uh, type systems. Now, a key result from this program is being demonstrated at the ERI Summit this week. IBM has a booth at the summit to show the value of improved sensor processing for more capable and safer autonomous vehicles by sensing more data and communicating that to the rest of the fleet. So please come and see that, and please contact me with any other interest regarding the technologies from the program. This concludes the technical session discussions for day one. Join us in the exhibit hall to view posters and demos. Parallel workshops will begin at 3.15 p.m.